reading, I'm going to shut off the chat. And then after the reading's over, I'll turn the chat back on and we'll stay for discussion. And uh, for those of you who've been staying, you'll know that things have been just getting a little bit thicker and a little bit more energetic and more thoughtful at the same time every week. So I think it, it seems like a nice conversation is developing. So I'm going to turn things over to Mary Newell, who is introducing us for the day. Thanks. Greetings, everyone. Uh, and I don't want to repeat for those who have been coming every week, but I know a few people are new. So um, this anthology began uh, by my responding to Dispatch's website when they asked who would like to try to do something with a website. And I said, why not Eco Poetics? Mm -hmm. So it was a, a nice idea. And I never envisioned it would bloom the way it has uh, with first an online anthology and the print anthology to come out. And then all of these readings, which I think really enrich um, the experience quite a bit. So uh, there has been on the ASLE discussion board, the Association uh, for the Study of Literature and Environment, there has been a little bit of exchange this week about what uh, the more than human in our title might mean. Um, poetics for the more than human world. And I think, uh, you know, I would just say it's the best approximate label we could come up with. I think partly in my mind it was uh, it was more than the exclusively human way of looking at things. Um, I think you know we do have human nervous system and perceptual capacities so uh, that means we will always be seeing the world through human faculties. At the same time I find personally it's very interesting to try for instance to picture the world through the eyes of a an insect who sees color differently or an animal who hears differently. Just uh, at least, if nothing else, is a reminder that the way that I'm seeing the world is, is partial. And um, one of the things we might pursue in our discussion today are the many different ways that writers have tried to expand their horizon beyond a purely anthropocentric way of approaching uh, reality of being in the world and of writing about that experience. Um, which is challenging when it comes to finding a voice. So uh, let's begin with Thomas Rain Crow, who unfortunately couldn't get his video to work, but his audio is working fine. Hello, sorry that uh, you can't see me, but I'm here if you're in Tuckasegee in Western North Carolina mountains. Um, I've got three short poems to share with you today. The first one is a poem from a collection of dance poems um, that I wrote uh, in the 1970s when in San Francisco I was studying with the Pacific Ballet. And the first one is one of the poems that came out of that, that collection. It's called Learning to Dance. I am disappearing into the side of her body. Her body, which when it lifts and turns, also moves the earth. I have given up the toys of my childhood and my ambitions for old age and have moved deep within the walls of her silver skin. I am through with my love of suffering and the words that describe that love. I am going to carry on a magnificent affair with the wind from the inside of her body where we both sleep. Friends, I am going deeper, even deeper inside than the animal or a blade of grass. I'm looking for the stones, the stones that lay to the side and in the bed of the great river. Among those stones, there is only one rock with my name. I will pick it up and hold it high above my head in the inner light. I will know many things. Outside with her body, she is teaching the world to dance. The next poem was written, well, actually many years later, uh, I got into translating 14th century Sufi master mystic poet Hafez 
then some years after that, I decided I wanted to try to write a couple poems like Hafez and his voice and uh, with similar sentiments. And this is one of those, A Higher Love. And it starts with an epigram by the rock uh, artist Steve Winwood. Epigram is, think about it. There must be a higher love down in the heart or hidden in the stars above. Without it, life is wasted time. Look inside your heart. I'll look inside mine. Oh, whiskey bringer, I am drunk on the rye of love. And my head and heart keep spinning around all day. Forgive me of all my lust, for now is a time for higher love. O oh, lover, since we met, I am no longer afraid to die. From here I can see forever. There is nothing in these eyes but wind. O oh, love, teach me to swim, for I am drowning in your eyes. Call me a fool or give me a crazy name. When we are together, darkness and light are both the same. On this peasant's farm, I grow cherries harvested only for your lips. We were wed through a window of time. Who are we to say what is real? Oh, Romeo, how were you chosen with so much luck? To find a Juliet is worth more than all the world's desires. And finally, a, a poem that um, really is a reflection of my work over the years uh, with the environment, environmental organizations, and conservation, and uh, with the bioregional movement. Uh, it's a poem called The Sacred. The seed of spirit is in the flower, and the flower lives in the garden of all things. Nowhere has the rock or the wood become so fertile as in the womb of the earth, in the hands of plants, and in the stormy dreams of the gods. Like the farmer who tills sand along the shoreline of the sea, or poets without ink, we are born into this world of grace with only the seeds of memory and a song of our ancient race. Through the warm tears of love, the eyes of fire and the mountains dance. How quickly the mind becomes water as we gaze at the moon. This silver that lays side by side with gold in the poem of night. And like the dew, this moon will pass away. Everything is sacred. Thank you and be well and take care. Thank you so much, Thomas Crow. Uh, next is- uh, Wait, uh, there's, there are two people who aren't muted. So unless you're the person reading, would you check and make sure that your mute is on? Thank you, sorry, Mary. Our next reader is Ruth Lepson. Ruth, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Ruth, you're muted. Okay. Yeah. First, thanks to Mary and to Sarah and to Bernard and to Cole and to Dispatches and to Simon Fraser University and to Charles and also an enthusiastic uh, an enthusiastic shout of support that it's coming out in paperback. So thanks all of you because this is certainly the essential subject of our time. So uh, I'm going to read something atypical because I wrote it yesterday and it's about things that are on my mind this week and this during this period. Uh, <laughs> So it's a prose poem in three pages. 
and it's called the yellow tulip. When Garrett died, the image of a yellow tulip popped up in my mind. And as childish as it seemed, I couldn't shake it. Now I think I understand. It's the golden flower, symbol of the philosopher's stone, temple of the wise, elixir of life. The Jains of Rajasthan, India, devote themselves to feeding flocks of demoiselle cranes who migrate at 23,000 feet over the Himalayas. The first verse of the Ramayana curses the hunter who kills the male of a pair. Because all verse was considered received until then, this passage is considered the oldest composed poetry in the world. People who have ventured far from home or undertaken difficult journeys are often compared to these delicate cranes. Within decades, a quarter of the Earth's population will be forced to migrate. Homer, who was not really one person, traveled to India. So did Plato and Democritus, which may be where they learned about atoms, those irreducible bits of matter. Their speculation really a quest for immortality, a way to reconstitute a dead body. Democritus claimed that Bodily atoms are triangles with prongs, and round fire atoms, the soul. The other aspect of life is the void through which the atoms travel. Is it lonely to remain anonymous or a relief, like becoming ordinary? Two Zen masters were checking out in parallel lines at the supermarket nodding to each other they knew. What might it mean to know in silence? I've wanted to know you, what it must be like to love in silence without desire to articulate your desire, living in color in the meadows and in the low mountains. A certain number of those who film secretly inside factory farms commit suicide especially after their first exposure. The cruelty is so extreme. Adrian Rich said these things. I want to know what you are experiencing. Very few people are willing to go the whole way with you, so make a pact that you will never desert one another. Real friendships are frightening because they involve telling the truth. Something got hotter and infinitely more dense until its interior turned to lead, then exploded, creating everything. We, the constellations, the triumphant stars, the half moon. Tennyson's Ulysses says wistfully, I am not what I once was. Happy few. Since Inanna, goddess of the heaven and earth, tricked her sister into letting her escape from the underworld, the days go on. Was Inanna the chief god of Mesopotamia? For the foreseeable future, that will remain unknown since there aren't enough people alive to translate the rest of the hieroglyphic tablets. A volcano will erupt when Trump refuses to leave office. Violence in the street, some talk about about that, while others are convinced things will return to normal. Myself, I think we're at the threshold of a new world. Either worse, is that possible, or better, the best of all possible worlds? The Greeks were well aware that they were newcomers to their region of the world. Persia, Mesopotamia, and Egypt had existed for centuries. In Egypt, very little changed through time as Isis protected the meaning of things, whereas in Greece, new words were constantly being invented and argument was everything. Longfellows is the first poem I memorized. The world is so full of a number of things, I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. How jaded we've become. We question whether kings are happy. And who's this speaker so cocksure of himself? Which things is the world so full of anyway? Garbage heaps or lollipops, we still manufacture them. And love, 
After all, if everything is made of the same irreducible element, our insides and the outside world are the same, n'est-ce pas? I should practice my French before the end of the world, possibly to converse with native speakers in heaven. Well, we just go on doing what we've always done. And where in the world does William Blake, meanwhile? Among the angels, I'm more inclined to believe in them lately than any gods. Voltaire, who added bits of chocolate, a luxury to his coffee, he was a fanatic, wrote that hope was his favorite way of thinking in human beings. So he wasn't kidding in a way when he said the best of all possible worlds. But tender garden we have not done. On the BBC in Yemen, a young woman pleads with the doctor, please don't tell us about the virus. We have enough horror already. Patchless, spreading out from the center as the branches from the tree. She said sometimes she imagines she's a tree planted firmly in the ground. That would bother me, a fundamental difference between plants and animals being that animals can move around. Putting people in solitary confinement. Take just one thing, a polar bear melting on an ice, uh, a polar bear on a melting ice floe, make an ad out of it. When a Tibetan master knows he's going to die, he retires to his mountain hut. A few weeks later, the others come. This has happened thousands of times that followers enter the hut only to find that there's no skeleton there, just hair and nails and floating around the room, <coughs> rainbows. Once his car swayed in a storm on a bridge, since then he's avoided bridges. Me, he said, imagine me being afraid of something. The alchemical process won't work when attempted at the wrong time. As the Hindu expression goes, things go where they are wanted. What harm is there in that? That doesn't mean that everything happens for a reason, which is a cruel way of thinking. He insists that aliens have lived on Earth for thousands of years. When I say that's ridiculous, he says, I don't have an open mind. Anything can happen. No, it can't, I say. Do you think that lamp could turn into a peacock? Maybe, he says. How can you be sure that it can't? Cause and effect is a Western concept. There is no such thing. It's like synchronicity claims Jungian Marie-Louise von Franz. It happens, but that doesn't mean we know anything about it or anything about alchemy. The unconscious rules alchemy. The individual's dreams remain powerful. It's collective dreams which religions promote. When people delve into the unconscious and surface, they make jokes and treat other people as idiots. It's too much to take in at once. This is the way Jung describes the process of individuating. This process must take place over and over. In this week's New York Review of Books, Bill McKibben discusses Mark Linus's A Final Warning, Six Degrees of Climate Emergency. Have a look at the review of four books on animal language, one making a case for interspecies democracy. This is all there is. Why read another book on the last hundred days of Hitler? And at the end of this is a quote from Christian Bach. A tulip dipped in liquid nitrogen undergoes instantaneous cryonics, whereupon the flower can be smashed to bits as easily as a wine glass. A word when read aloud is such a crystal being, being shattered by a sequence of high frequency vibrations. Thank you, Ruth Lepson. Our next reader is Daniel Wolf. Thank you, Mary, and th thank you everybody um, for making this possible. I am coming to you via my cell phone because tropical storm Isaias has gotten rid of all my power. 
um, I mean, electrical power and uh, my internet. Um, so if I don't think I'll fade out, but I may not last the full time here. Uh, what I've been doing the last couple of days is um, clean up fallen trees with a chainsaw and thinking about eco-poetics. I think those two go together. Um, we can debate that later. And I've been reading um, Emily Dickinson and Laureen Nidecker and thinking how eco-poetics has been around a long time. What is great to me about both their poetry is um, an empathy with nature, of course, but also a kind of um, stubborn refusal to draw meaning from it or maybe to impose meaning on it. Um, Dickinson keeps kind of toying with the idea of, you know, the worm and the little birdie and how there should be a moral, but she doesn't give us one often. And uh, Nidecker has a great poem. I can't quote it, but a um, poem about an owl where she describes the owl. And at the end, she says, what is this a sign of? And the last line is, it's a sign of an owl, which I always thought was right on the money. So I, I'm going to read a poem that uh, is in the anthology. It's called The Evolution of a Silhouette, Evolution of a Silhouette. And uh, I, it started as a collaboration with artist Donna Dennis, who'd been traveling in the Midwest a bunch and um, been fascinated by the iron ore boats that come down and done a series of watercolors of the boats in silhouette in the docks they're next to. And we were talking about doing something together. And she said, well, to me, they're the ship of death. They arrive at night and they somehow are eerie that way. And I thought, yeah, you know, an owl is an owl. You know, I wonder what the actual story of the ore boats is and the history of them. And as I got deeper into it, and I think this is why it's in an anthology of eco poetics, it had to do with our species and how we, whether with ore boats or chainsaw, uh, want to change nature and how that is both awful and beautiful, and sort of courageous. So, Evolution of a Silhouette. Red rock buried under evergreen, but the falls at Sault Ste. Marie prevent supply from reaching demand. No break, flat bowl, Great Lake horizon. 1855, locks punch through shelf rock, allow 21 foot measured drop. Earth begins to leak south. Iron ore from open pit loaded into Columbia, wooden schooner, pale smudge on gray sky, 200 tons per trip. War converts canvas light into steel hull, steam driven. 1882, Anoko, largest freighter yet, foredeck raised for pilot house, stern raised for engine room, in between slung low, to hold iron, coal, wheat, a box to cart a thousand tons, profile blunt as need. 1896, expanded locks, expanded profit margins, docks and towns and distant cities, all gilded by expanding market, great surge of construction. Five and six hundred foot long freighters hump between the humpbacked aisles. 12,000 trips a year, try to gouge a route between lake and open sea. World War I increased demand, clogs the yards at River Rouge, welded transverse arches, take average load 10,000 tons. Rising weight of iron dollar interrupted by Great Depression. Wealth remains in frozen earth as rusted hulls weep white. When war cuts through again, new freighters, forged from slag and scrap, rush to answer starving mills, supply of ore unabated. Wilfred Sykes launched 49, length approaching 700, gross tonnage 20,000, the shape she strikes in chill water, the product of a long tradition. Still the lifted prow and aft, still amidships flat and low. Still the underlying bulk, dense, dark, triumphant. 1981, 
Columbia Star to honor first schooner. A thousand feet of steel that holds 50,000 tons. Self unloading bolt carrier, self directed by satellite, steers the same glacial track, ends up raised, cargo hidden, later christened American Century. Lake to lock to lake, the loads, dust left over from old extractions, crush to form iron pellets, ride on belts of man made shadow. Across great lakes, Great floating walls strain still to carve the sky, to mark again moving water, to hear the weight of iron earth, brief as silhouette. Thank you, Daniel. Our next reader, um, actually, it's a collaboration. We'll start with Beth Frost and then Cynthia Hook. Hi everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here with you all and with my collaborator, Cynthia. And I'm really grateful for this series, um, for the dispatches issues and for the forthcoming books. So thank you so much to everyone who's making all of this happen. I'm going to start uh, with two pieces from a series that I completed with the artist Diane Kornberg, who also collaborated with me and Cynthia on the work that we'll share in a moment. This first series is called Remains, and it juxtaposes Diane's images of animal remains with my prose meditations on environmental disaster, extinction, and uh, dystopia. So I'm going to show you an image as I read, and um, uh, these do not have titles, but I'll just indicate what uh, the creature is. So this uh, is sea urchin. We call it Aristotle's lantern, the urchin's five-toothed mouth. A botched translation stuck. Why would Aristotle name that tiny jaw a source of light? He meant the domed body, lantern-shaped, though nothing's lit, lit where they live. We call that the abyssal zone. In our tepid waters, a starfish die-off means urchins spread their hedgehog spines unchecked on the ocean floor, bottom of the bottom, shadowless. For now, they're thriving in zones where nothing else can. We call these urchin barrens. And this is a tube worm. In afterlife, the collagen went rogue fossilized into a maze of mineral hollows, curves of duplexes bequeathed to no one. Once, flesh unfolded in little rings, each added on like a first grade sum, its body storing our contaminants. So that was a couple from Remains, and now I'm going to uh, introduce the collaboration that Cynthia and I um, are still working on, also with the artist Diane Kornberg. And this is what's included in the anthology. Um, the series is called A Dickinson Bestiary, A Choreograph. And the project began with our curiosity about the way that Dickinson stages encounters between human and non-human animals. As two poet critics and a visual artist, we asked how we might engage Dickinson's complex animal worlds. Each poem of ours thinks through an animal encounter in a specific Dickinson poem or poems. 
Sometimes we explicate that poem or cite criticism or theory, including recent ideas drawn from animal studies. And throughout, we cite, we, we often borrow rather, Dickinson's lexicon. The images by Diane sprang from our shared discussions, which focused on the notion of circumference as a mapping of space and as the creation of an environmental surround. So to start, I'm going to read one of two Dickinson poems that you see here. Um, and there are two ones that feature a spider. And I used this and the other Dickinson poem that I fell in love with um, as a point of departure for my own spider poem. Then I'll read that poem and then hand off to Cynthia. The spider holds a silver ball in unperceived hands and dancing softly to himself, his yarn of pearl unwinds. He plies from knot to knot in unsubstantial trade, supplants our tapestries with his in half the period. An hour to rear supreme his continents of light, then dangle from a housewife's broom, his boundaries forgot. Homeless at home, I felt myself a visitor in the orb web's reticent domain. Nor here, nor there, its continents of light. The animal, says the philosopher, does not open itself in a world. Absolute circumference, its balm. A human knows it's open to a closedness, knows what is and is not beyond its now. A room, say, in which a spider unspools its silver ball, a means to all necessities, the while not knowing its own doings, not knowing a human eye occupies its space. I left its unsubstantial trade intact. Not even the lark, says the philosopher, can see the open. Thank you. I'm going to pause the screen share and hand over to Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And I, I just want to add a bravo to everybody. Um, Mary, Bernard, and Sarah for the splendid anthology. And um, Cole and Linda and Charles for curating and, and um, recording and to all the other writers. Very, very. This is Dickinson's poem 1408 of The Bat. The bat is done with wrinkled wing like callow article and not a song pervade his lips or none perceptible. His small umbrella quaintly have auspiciously withheld. To his adroit creator, ascribe no less the praise, beneficent, believe me, his eccentricity. And my bat poem is uh, very much an encounter with um, Dickinson's poem, um, the bat in Dickinson's poem. But I will say very quickly that when I woke up at 5 a.m. yesterday morning, our veranda was full of bats. Um, it was quite magical. We'd never seen that before. Bat, not heard, but seen. Done, done. 
The not song of the no song pervade his lips, or self-corrected to undecidable status, none perceptible to us, but not said, assumed, pervade to other bats. The loaded words alliterative, the consequential P's of both explosive plosives, are what we hear supplanting and see describing in the air the bat. By poetic echolocation. The unheard song, the question of what conducted in the not song of the imperceptible, when plosive sonic markers of the penultimate line, beneficent, believe me, forged the old term feminine rhyme with the amphigraph creator. Um, I'd like to share just a few of the poems I've been working on this spring, um, which are um, in dialogue with the artist Morgan O'Hara's um, series called 19 Forms of Containment. And um, I, the, my series is ekphrastic, but I was also tracing, retracing her process which involved following the international Jews in Germany uh, when the lockdown um, came. And she followed events in the States through the International New York Times, and I retraced her steps. So you'll hear some of that lexicon from New York Times articles and op-eds. COVID-19, the third form of containment. Our multitude still as nature gets to work, clearing detritus, composting waste, covering debris in green and gold. Though skirmish and terror continue until the virus reach fighters and civilians alike, when darkness contains the tendrils and rustles that connect us, the global burgeon of lives together enclosed on earth. Animal plant, mineral, interrupted and changed. What the pandemic means for climate change, 2020. Something strange is sweeping the planet, clearing its waters and air, offering a glimpse of Earth's power to repair as a human nightmare unspooled the gut-wrenching reality hitting the most vulnerable, the hardest. A best case outcome includes rethinking the social contract at a time when leaders bow all Darwin on us. We need to ask, what does a government owe its people? And we need to hear it answer us. And in this last poem, Lessons in Constructive Solitude uh, from Thoreau, um, there is a conjunction, uh, thanks to the coincidence of language and event at the end, which is simply elegiac. The epigraph is from Thoreau. Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live and could not spare more time for that one that one being Walden. At rare intervals, a yogi, antennas raised to the communicating consciousness of nature, to seasons and all creatures four-legged, winged, gale. A crank, no simple pacifist, his support of abolitionist John Brown's armed rays, still hot to the touch. Himself in word and deed, Unviolent. Thoreau resisted the warmongering, slave supporting government, argued that purposeful solitude, codependent with principled communities, were the source of the country's long term social health. As now civilly, the justice minded march to avail justice for the dead who were not spared their lives to live. Thank you.
Cynthia and Beth, thank you very much. Um, our next reader is Rob Fontini. Hi, um, I just wanted to take a second to thank everyone who's worked on this. It's um, been really nice to be part of from afar and to watch everything that's going on. Um, I'm just going to read um, a translation. So maybe this is something a little bit different. This is something I've been working on. Um, I had been working on a few months ago and when I was thinking about what I could read here, I decided to uh, put this back together. So it's, um, it's we'll call it memory, it's put it in. Uh, so, flowers and water must sing and decide whether or not there is God. The bride's day is beautiful, though honor makes us squeamish, and a lack of form is frightening when greed is the approach. The most high is beyond doubt. It can alter the day with little need for law, unlike the humans who must remain with it. Certainly most would like to be there. After all, the divine are not capable of everything. The mortals reach for the abyss while it reaches back for them. Time is long, though what is true occurs. But how, my love? At bottom we see sunshine and dry dust and forests deep with shadows and smoke blooming on rooftops from crests of old towers and larks coo lost in the wind and the well-led sheep of heaven graze by daylight and snow like mayflowers shines with the green alpine grass noble where it may be notable and that's the half of it one rose with another on harsh roads, speaking of the cross. Once dead, the law is on its way. What is this? My Achilles, dead on a fig tree, and Ajax lies at the grottoes near the sea, at the tributaries of Xanthos. The once quick-witted Ajax died thanks to the inflexible customs of his homeland. Patroclus too, but in king's armor, and still many others have died. It is quite sad. Near Scytheron lies Eleuthere, the city of memory. Evenings, it releases a siren call, like the derobing of God. The divine are otherwise reluctant if one does not care for the soul, and one should, but there is no sorrow here. Thanks, and I'm gonna read uh, two of my own, which aren't in the collection. This first one is called Equilibrium. A whole generation that always knew this thing was already over is a unit of historical knowledge now in a cycle of repetition. Today, constructing celebrations of inheritance, it sings to me, and all those vocables just told to an aging woman who really didn't need to hear it. Understanding too, either it moves in these sorts of cycles or explodes into that finite completion at the heart of all failed inquiries into communication, which eschew biography and at the end of a line represent anticipation. Relating desperation, sometimes arbitrarily the whole story is explained, falls on deaf ears waiting for the computation stuff to fix the problem of space, which is a sort of inconvenience in the person or whatever unsatisfactory answer to subjectivity. What is and what ends now seem to be the same unanswered question. Because physically it means nothing, a scientist writes repeatedly in some publication, elaborating an important thermodynamic problem, currencies wish not to change place. Um, this last one is called to speak is to fulfill a basic task of nature. I saw you in the net, in all those cross hatchings of what there is in the future, like plain dandelions blossoming among spring. Doctor, such things cannot be simply nipped in the bud. When I was 15, drove to Philadelphia with two tanks of nitrous oxide. Ah, the laughing, the intuition of release. These adventure stories, the poets of the 1950s play in loops, like each finite occurrence 
to be revisited forever jump off points. It is an access to the unity of it all, all things indivisible, allegedly in motion. Yet with this, I experience too the pull of sequestration. Is it beauty? The supreme stillness of the eyes, an open incantation of, from speech, I am suddenly a white birch on a sparsely populated hill in summer, calling upon, accepting that, the body in time needs help and begs for the supplement. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And our final speaker is uh, Mural Siva Ramakrishnan. Hello, everybody. I hope I'm audible now. Yeah, uh, I am Murli Sivaramakrishnan. Uh, I used to be professor and head of the department of English in Pondicherry University in the southeast of India. I have taken voluntary retirement you know, to pursue my own interest in painting and uh, 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 poetry. So I have moved to my hometown where I grew up in Tiruvanandapuram, that is in southwest coast of India. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, uh, you know, read poetry across cultures and quite difficult to, you know, choose the right kind of uh, uh, poems. Anyway, I have chosen some small poems so that I can read them and get them across. The first one is called The Bleeding Tree. It's from my selected poems. The Bleeding Tree. There is a tree that bleeds on the hill, or so they said. Each time in the valley, a tree is cut or a branch broken, a leaf plucked, it bleeds. Now I have crossed the river and taken the roving path across the valley. There is no tree where they said it stood. It must have become a piece of wood or a chair or table, a window frame or a doorknob. Someone has even thoughtfully gouged out its roots. There is only a mound of burnt grass here. The sun is setting beyond the valley. The river has darkened. And now, in the distant hills, all trees are bleeding all day. Uh, the next one is a poem which uh, I have included in my conversations with children. It's a poem called uh, Passim in Passing. Uh, it speaks about my father. My father has been a kind of poetic inspiration for me all along. Passim. As the first cotton seeds broke and the fluff floated about in the fine breeze, we ran in circles, you and I, catching the handfuls only to blow them around. There was so much to laugh about, drenched in thin shreds. Safe in your hefty hands, I spotted my first bird, an oriole among the neems. You named it for me. When you stood with that distant look in your eyes, coffee cup in hand, and recited the long narratives of the 19th century poets, I heard the brooks and hills of some faraway land resound with your clear voice of unreason. Down by the sea, you and I stood amazed and watched the sun like an upturned pot shrink and spread out between the palms, sand tingling our eyes and legs. You had nothing to call your own, not even your beliefs, but only a store of tales about yourself which I listened to wide-eyed. You will leave me one day, I know, like everyone else, an old man, bald, wrinkled, acerbic, among the aging, dying, parting. You are no seer, nor even unwise enough to counsel me. Your wisdom lies like a nimbus round your portrait that I disfigure. My mirror does not lie to me about your face that infringes on my brow. The flowers leave and return. The coconut fills with juice again and again. 
the jasmine blooms out of all seasons and the cotton seeds break all day o oh, father shall i break this mirror that reflects everything on the obverse as i said it's quite difficult to choose the kind of you know poems which you can uh, uh, reach across cultures i have chosen another poem on a vegetable the vegetable that i have written about is yam yam is part of our major vegetarian delight in asia and africa yam for those who love the earth the yam is a surprise versatile starch and tuber a treasure beyond the red soil the soul of earth buried deep within folds of mud and silt clinging to her with a million fibrous nerves feeding on water and the remnants of other lives a life beyond our little selves the coils of wonder that uncurl over slow time a brown and red surprise the yam is solid ripple gushing from the other side of reality life to touch and taste it occurs on the borderland where sky and rain mix with the sun's life hiding unrevealing elegant when it sends forth its shoots upward standing tall as if to reunite with the light forever buried in dark till it breaks free and splits to reveal in red softness of its afterlife this is from my uh, poetry anthology called silverfish and uh, the the title piece is silverfish an insect with which all of us who love libraries and books are familiar with the silverfish is very much part of our library silverfish this is no fish no underwater saint thriving on sugar and saccharin lepisma saccharina moving to the tune of centuries wearing time out on uneasy shelves swiveling in the death throes of unread words searing through agony and anguish not sparing joy anger love nor even dictionaries speared by split tail flying ripping battling and chasing the printed word and silent space ransacking meaning to the core in one repast and relish devouring tiny morsels in the dark load bit by bit in the event of words against time and decay in no rest either there is always more to gather together forwards and backwards an argosy of silence dissecting abacus and alphabet even after all lights are turned off slithering through words in the dark a large richly laden repast awaits all times in unread tomes you know poems actually come as per our moods sometimes because most of us who teach for a living we can also write at any time but then genuine poems come because of certain experiences and it's difficult to not to allow it to happen this is a poem which is part of my series of poems which i call notebook of a naturalist it's called fireflies like matchsticks impulsive a blaze against magnesium they stab the dark i once saw a whole tree flare up with fireflies that was years back when i walked in the dark they broke in like a million mutineers into my solitude then beside the still stream tonight i see but a single one turning round and round like lucifer caught unaware out of bounds lone exiled once more another journey ends in fire 
eco politics the entire series of writings and uh, recordings and recitings and uh, the future edited volume is basically primarily talking about the interrelationship between nature and human beings what we call the inside and outside the inner and outer world and uh, i have tried to bring in some selections from vegetables from human experiences from uh, uh, animals and now birds birds are my uh, uh, weaknesses in that way because i have been a bird watcher for a pretty long time i hope i have time half a minute to read this short poem it's called the golden oriole those of us who are familiar with birds will certainly know that the oriole is a fabulous bird it's most beautiful it is attractive even as a child you are moved by that the golden oriole i had not known so much happiness until that rainy afternoon when the first oriole fluted from across the mango trees a clear delightful call filled with the brightness of sunshine slowly fading in the afternoon light no night and day after that could take away the golden oriole's fruity call it hung like a rhyme over the mango trees and it still does the rains have come and gone i cannot say the same thing about happiness so a special word of thanks to the uh, editors of this anthology and all the all of you who have been kind enough to come and listen and participate in the discussions i am eagerly waiting for responses about poetry so i am so glad that i could just exchange these poems and talk about this across cultures thank you all thank you very much thank you all for reading and uh each week has been different and one of the surprises this week is the oriole Dickinson also had an oriole poem it it includes in it one of the ones that Midas touched uh Midas the god who turned everything into gold so i can't quote the whole poem but it's interesting that we have these intersections so this is our i'm going to turn back to Cole but this is our time for sharing um we hope the readers uh will speak and people will raise questions and we can all exchange among ourselves <clears throat> I wanted to remind everybody uh, that I also have opened up the chat so if you want to communicate that way that's possible too and uh if we just do the free for all and see what things come up what one thing that struck me this week was relationship to knowledge it seemed like the question of knowledge was constantly being looked at and uh whether it's knowledge from others from other literatures knowledge from observation uh from a documentary approach and i obviously knowledge is so important to eco poetic exploration and i wondered if anybody wanted to talk about their approach their thoughts on knowledge what they saw coming up strange well uh, I'll, um one of one of the things that probably was the most um challenging and you saw how i i i saw the challenge was to really engage with dickinson's poetics but that and i were working with this notion of um out of animal um relation theory that animals are um uh humans are always familiarizing animals but in um in fact um we do not know their world and that makes any poetic attempt to write about them um kind of uh not exactly precisely colonizing but a way of familiarizing them um and i i feel with the poem that i i read that um i simply didn't quite engage with that i engaged with how dickinson navigated that um but 
does. She constantly will make a statement and then step back and make it undecidable. And I felt that was a more respectful way of approaching the animal world that she had observed so closely. Um, and, uh, you know, the, just in her backyard, as we know, and in her domestic space. I think that the issue of the colonizing is a really, really important one. And it's a very easy trap to fall into coming from what one imagines is an empathetic place to actually appropriate the voice of the experience. And so thinking about that in terms of knowledge, it's also the capacity and a little bit of keys here of, you know, for, for lacking knowledge and not needing to fill in the gap with what we imagine must be the case. Murali, could you could you maybe respond to that a bit um, in terms of how you approach the the Oriole, um, the powerful emotion of your that was so palpable in your in your observation. I don't know. Uh, uh, perhaps this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is theorizing a little bit, because uh, uh, here in our context in India, uh, I'm not being partisan, of course, but I'm trying to say that, you know, we have uh, maybe levels of uh, knowledge. We could talk about, you know, information at the at the at the basic level where we are all informed about it, like we can check out our Google and uh, whatever we want and get the info. And then knowledge comes out of a certain kind of, you know, uh, interaction with the inner and outer. We call it, you know, mananam, mananam in terms of the mind, you know, you, you put it in your mind and you integrate it with your inside and it becomes a kind of uh, knowledge that way, which which also is at the, uh, 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 at the level of, uh, uh, scientific uh, knowledge, but a little beyond that, uh, perhaps we could use this gradation a little higher than that is what we call wisdom, a, a sense of uh, uh, empathy and uh, uh, sympathy which comes out of uh, understanding and compassion. There is no listener, there is no nothing to listen, there is no process of listening and there is nothing by which to listen but you are there, being there at that time, it's something of a higher uh, uh, knowledge process, something that actually leads us beyond that. Perhaps this is what actually uh, uh, eco ecologically sensitive poetry is all about. You know, we, we are not confining ourselves to our uh, little world of uh, human senses, but we are opening up and we are unlimiting ourselves, unmuting ourselves, so that we become everything at one go. And then that open experience is something which actually uh, leads us to recognize the Oriole. I mean, whatever I have chosen here, uh, uh, the Oriole as such, and maybe list the Oriole, recognize the Oriole, uh, and write it as an ornithologist would, and uh, observe it as a scientist would, but at the same time, let it experience, I mean, let that experience come into yourself. The same is the case with the yam, which I try to uh, uh, focus on, you know, how the, the vegetable becomes kind of, you know, uh, something of an experience, something of a sudden surprise. So at every level, the vegetable level, the vegetative, the material level, and the growth level, you know, the, the vitality or the power of plants, and then at the mobility of the animals and birds and at the intellectual and cognitive level of the human being, we can talk about eco-poetics opening up. Perhaps this is what I try to theorize. So I was worried whether I was trying uh, uh, to intellectualize it too much. But then since you asked that question, uh, uh, I'm glad that I could explain this in this way. Thank you. I was struck um, in several things today of, of this kind of opening up, but involved 
a stepping outside oneself. You know, the very first I think, poem by Tom began, I disappear. And it was, I disappear, you know, into the dance or, or into the wind, uh, the, in the act of translation that, you know, that Rob did. Um, there's, there's a stepping outside of oneself. And certainly in inhabiting any of that Emily Dickinson territory, there's a step outside of oneself. And I'm wondering if that is a, an important thing to do in terms of getting away from colonizing. You know, to, uh, you know, you, you almost make an immediate step to become some kind of other yourself in communication with this otherness. We, Anybody uh, want to respond to that? <laughs> I was going to quickly, um, it seems to me to touch on two things. One, um, the pronoun discussion that we had last week. And Two, the theme of loss, and in going back and listening to some of the discussions from previous weeks, I was intrigued to see how much loss came up, and I was thinking about loss in a positive way. So in this case, the losing the boundary. Mm -hmm. Loss can mean an inclusivity, and the I getting lost in the we, the us uh, incorporating the they, or the, the they getting lost in a greater inclusivity for which someone's taking responsibility. So that stepping beyond the self seems to me to be directly uh, and directly related and bringing a physicality to that loss. Yeah, there was a there was a moment in uh, Murali's first poem where he said, "You know, now I am crossing the river," and I thought that was another kind of stepping into something else. Yeah. And I think that's what we sent. I, uh, uh, sorry. You know, I, I think I also appreciate the moment, I think it was in Daniel Wolf's work when he said, you know, what is an owl a sign of? It's a sign of an owl. You know, there's a kind of restraint and pulling back from human narcissism. I think that's also important in this kind of thinking. You know, and then, you know, at the opposite end of it, I also appreciated Ruth's different sense of the human in that when she said putting people in solitary confinement is related to, I think, the destruction of the natural world. You know, those two poles of um, restraint to me are both kinds of ethics. And there's an ethics, I think, in eco-poetics that we're trying to find as writers. Um, which I thought was just interesting in those polls in this reading. Yeah, I'm, I'm deeply confused. Uh, and I remember maybe Rachel and maybe Jonathan and some others here will remember there was a conference and I don't know how long ago it was, 15 years ago at Columbia, of what's going on in contemporary poetry. Mm -hmm. and, and Jonathan, were you on the eco panel? Sure. Yes, I was with Sherman yeah. Sweet and Susan Howe. Yes. Yeah, and 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 I remember Sherman Batsui really knocked me out. The whole panel knocked me out of all the kinds of poetry that were read and discussed at the conference. This one really, um, it seemed the largest and most essential to me, and yet I felt I couldn't just go back and start writing eco poetry because decide something like that and I have thought how little time I've spent in nature you know the same as most people I've spent a lot of my life indoors and on what authority and from what angle can I speak about nature and also about animals and I agree with whoever posted that zoo poetics is enormously important Jared Schickling whom some of you know he's a, a wonderful a poet who writes about animals and the rights of animals. And um, I wish there were more of that. I, I don't know what to say about the issue of, of colonizing. I feel with uh, Morali, one reason that I loved his poetry was there was such tenderness in it. He felt a tenderness for the yam and for the oriole. Is that enough? I, is the horror of destroying so many creatures on the planet 
enough? Does it make any sense to express that kind of outrage or is that just preaching to the converted? So I wonder if you want to say anything about that. Anybody actually. I just would jump in. I, what I loved about um, your poem, your, your poems, Ruth, was their capaciousness. And mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking of, they got me thinking about the commodity when you, when you invoke sugar and popsicles and popsicle sticks and then Morales writing about yams and um, the, the, the eco-critic Joshua Schuster, uh, he's got a book on the ecology of modernity and he, he points out, you know, that we don't associate modernists with eco-poetics or ecology, but he's got a coda to his book. Um, where he, he writes about the commodity poem, you know, and like George Oppen writing about the engine. And so, you know, I'm wondering if that can be a part if that isn't really a crucial part of addressing colonization, which is to say commodities, which have had such a powerful role in shaping the world and subjugating other peoples to dominating systems. And uh, anyways, I just was, I don't know, I sort of got thinking about commodities um, and wondering if that's an important What's the name of that book? Uh, Joshua Schuster, he's an eco-critic. And the book? It's called The Ecology of Modernity. Thank you. But I should say one other thing while I'm on. Uh, Cynthia, when you were reading your, just before you read your poem, a bat, I was sitting outside and a, some bats were actually flying over, so. <laughs> we're lucky they're still with us. Yes, just Can two. I, I, I um, really liked Evelyn's point, and I think all of us are um, finding, try, moving towards that sense of an ethic in, in eco-poetics or, or even in poetics that um, other beings, which has become redolently clear this spring, um, have more room and room to breathe, um, room to repair when we are, <laughs> uh, our presence is diminished. Um, and it, it's almost like a collective um, consciousness raising this spring. I don't know if you were already there since you're in eco poetics, but it was very striking um, who who began to get it and how it began to be reported on. And um, I've been thinking about how to write about that and obviously don't provide any answers. Um, but in terms of simply not Populating, repopulating the world with our own identity or uh, in our own image. Um, that is you know, a small step. Rachel, were you going to add something? Yeah, I was going to say something. Am I, am I on? I guess I am. Um, sometimes I do wonder what we're concerned with. Is it a thematics? And that seems to be very important. Is it an attitude, like an ethical attitude, which we're all striving for, there's no doubt. But I worry on, on a, in another zone, which is when we say we're trying to be po sort of poetic, what poetic means, and also what language is, because we're, we all have different conventions of what we think poetry is, or what a poem means when it becomes adequate, you know, um, and I haven't really heard too many people note that every time we open our darn mouths, much less on the page, we're using choices of language as mediating veils or mediating filters or whatever you want to say, including poetic conventions that are very deep and, and deeply learned. And um, we, we're sort of sifting through those consciously, semi-consciously unconsciously, I'm not, you know, or a mixture of all of those at different times. And I worry that somehow we're forgetting that we're actually choosing languages and, and to say it maybe more awfully than, than most, choosing conventions of representation um, to do this work. And that's true of all poets. I mean, poetry, no matter what your thematic is and no matter what your, you know, your solution is. And I just want to acknowledge that fact. 
And part of the problem about representing otherness, like like animals, say, or insects or, or vegetables, is just trying to figure out what kind of language is adequate. I mean, that you're, you're inventing choices that you have to kind of continue with or sus- sustain or support in some way. And, you know, you don't really want another poetry that just becomes another poetry that and the some of the hope of of a more radical poetry whatever that radicalism progressive eco poetics feminist poetics anti colonial poetics whatever those things could be is somehow to make another sense of language that we can share among ourselves this is no small matter which is why i really have hesitated to raise it but I just want, first of all, we don't all speak the same language or dialect. Some of us are multilingual. That's very clear. Um, some people in other cultures, I acknowledge um, the subcontinent, have learned English as a, as a language, as another language that is the language of their university or education, as we all know well. And at the same time, perhaps there's another poetry that is infusing their work et cetera, et cetera. I will stop. Um, I'm just about language and representation as a thing that you have to think about that has not come up a ton. It's We've not that- from, from the idea of language as, as creating, that the language we use is creating. Is creating. And just a brief comment, um, I am so glad that Dickinson was so well represented this week. <laughs> The using language in unprecedented ways, I think, and talking about poetic convention, the convention of creating new conventions, of using language in really bizarre ways that actually will allow the unprecedented thought to emerge presented. I'm sorry I just walked downstairs. I was fascinated by what you were saying, Rachel, but I just got a note from Fanny Howe saying, are you on your porch? So I thought she might be sitting out there and could come to <laughs> the conversation, but she's not here yet. But, uh, but actually, one thing you do in your writing, it seems to me, is, I mean, you're writing one book for your whole life. More or less. And the inside and the outside are inseparable. Yeah, that's a very interesting remark. Yeah. Yeah, and... You're using what we might call innovative language, of course, but still managing to convey a great deal of emotion. And I'm interested in that because we do seem to have gone away from language poetry, which was so influential for so long, to poetry of identity. And that seems to be sort of the central question now. I'm sure you're thinking about that every day. I just, if you if you're addressing me, thank you for you know commending my work or whatever. I just think that it's really the poetry of critique. I mean, language poetry, whatever you want to say about it, is really a trying to critique the kinds of things that I was talking about. Whether I do it the same way, we won't discuss, obviously. But just about representation and language and what and poetry. What is poetry when people say they're there, you know, it's a poetic experience or something like that. I mean, I don't undercut it. I'm just like baffled by it finally in a funny kind of way. I mean, I've done it my whole life. It's not like I can't tell you what I think it is or whatever. But it, there's something very strange about how to use that for an ecologically adept and, and uh, ethical position. Do you have any thought about what Oppen might say about that? Um, <laughs> not anything that I could invent right off offhand. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It seems like don't put me on the spot. I'm not good at that kind of thing. <laughs> okay, Sorry. what can he say? What you know? Yes. <laughs> if anybody else does, I'd love to hear it. I mean, one thing I think is important that we don't see eco-poetics as a matter of thematics. I mean, I agree with Rachel. It's like, what does this mean for poetry? And Ruth, when you said, well, 
you know, I don't know. I, I, I live in an urban area. I don't know no, enough about an, animals that are going out in nature. I think that's not at all the point of what ecopedetics is really trying to achieve. This anthology, because it's called The More Than Human World, I think it leads us into these thinking about animals. But really, obviously, our sense of nature has been completely a disaster. We all <laughs> live in a completely transformed world that has to do everything with nature and climate and urbanity. And um, it's really, to me, it's, it's not even a genre of writing. It's how do we write to our current circumstance? And if we aren't all involved in an ecological thinking about social or or analyzing what nature even means, what does it mean to eat? What does it mean to migrate, um, you know, in this world? It's really trying to find a poetics that can start to embrace really the contemporary world as we meet it. Um, I just say that to say, you know, we could even widen our conversations beyond um, what seems to be implied by the more than human world. Who's speaking now? I'm sorry. Yeah, who is speaking? Oh, that's me, Evelyn. I thought so. It's funny, Evelyn. Oh, you're on, we can't see you move, and it just is your voice, but we can't oh. see you not moving, so that's curious. But, <laughs> but great, great point, and I, I just want to really... the, the it's not, my broadband. Sorry. But not being seduced by subject matter, and how can we think about a transformative poetics that's transforming through form. And that it seems like one of the things that an eco-poetics can do is redirect the attention to places where it really needs to be and it isn't otherwise being pointed to in our culture. And so thinking about innovative language, twisted language, renovated language, uh, seems to be perhaps a way of formally and I think there must be others as well, but formally redirecting that attention in a way that develops new knowledges through a kind of participatory attention. Uh, I ask a I? question. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You first. Oh, thank you. Um, can I ask a question harking back to the conversation that some of you have already had about the, 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 the word choice of the more than human world? I first came across that phrase uh, way back from David Abrams and the spell of the sensuous. And so the phrase for me is all very tied up in um, a kind of a phenomenological approach to being in the material world um, and, and to the portals of the senses, etc. Et, et um, and so if that's simply a repetition of everything that you guys already said, I apologize for wasting your time. Um, but, but did you, but you, did you trace that farther back in, um, in intellectual history and where that particular phrase kind of entered the public imagination? Hmm. I think the answer is no. Mary or Bernie, do you want to address that at all about? I think we didn't. Uh, we, we didn't trace its intellectual history. Or anything like that. I don't. Is it fun to do it now for just a second? I, yeah, and I'm, glad, and I'm glad that it's getting such discussion. I think it was kind of just sort of an informal. What do we call this choice, right? And and, and I'm glad to see that it's so evocative. We we did we did say we, we discussed the difference between of and for and, and things like that. Um, and we we talked somewhat about the implications of what is more than human, um, but we didn't. We, no, we didn't trace it in, in terms of history ideas or, or anything on that, or history of the, the phrase itself or anything like that. I, I didn't, anyway. Um, Mary, did you? Well, Elizabeth, I'm interested in hearing, hearing your thoughts about it. I mean, I certainly have lots of thoughts. You know, certainly we didn't want to create dichotomies. Uh, there was a discussion, as Bernie said, is it of the more than human world or for the... And we decided it was for the more than human world as our sort of statement of, of advocacy. Um, but, um, you know, there's this word other, which some people employ to uh, acknowledge the fact that everything outside us really is outside of us. But 
other very quickly creates dichotomous views. So I sort of like to go with what Cole was saying about I becoming we, but at the same time acknowledging, as in our discussion with Dickinson, that our, that our ways of perception are limited, right? They're limited by our species. They're limited by our education background. So there's, there's some, I mean, I think I'm going way beyond the title, but there's some way that humility has to come in here and, and acceptance of partiality and how one works with that in language, I think, can be really interesting. I mean, Dickinson had a method which was brought up, which was interesting, where she would state something. And then later in the poem, she would back away from it and show you how you really couldn't say that with conviction. So she did this with all the theories current at her time, you know, Darwin and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, that's one method now. I'm kind of interested in how when people write, if they sort of consciously adopt a method or if they just go back and self-correct when they see that actually they've ended up as I sometimes find, thinking that I'm writing about the natural world and I'm really just writing about myself, et cetera, you know? Uh, how we, um, but I think that a poem, uh, any poem could, you know, the old fashioned idea of the turn, but I think now if we think of the ecology as a dynamic living system, a poem somehow should reflect that, right? That the world that we, we see is not, fixed and static, it's moving all the time. How can that be reflected in the poem, right? We can have I really a like that. We don't sort of stick to it. Anyway, Elizabeth, I said more no, than I, I I do. I, I really like that, and mm -hmm. and and the degree to which uh, when when we when we grieve um, the catastrophic effect of the human footprint on the planet, right, and the degree to which we uh, we take basically I don't know sixty percent seventy percent of all primary productivity that comes through photosynthesis. You know, we we are consuming one species almost everything and. But, but if we go back to a kind of a phenomenological um, understanding of environing, it's a correction for um, being constantly the active agent, but al also being the recipient, right? And, and so um, be being the receiver of the more than human world, as well as the actor, in the more than human world, um, which I think goes to who was it? With Evelyn, was it you who were who was talking about humility um, and the importance of humility, or maybe it was Rachel? It was, I think it was Mary. It was me. It was but, Mary. <laughs> yeah, but no, I also want to bring in the idea of co-creation. You know, as in Francisco Varela and Maturana, that you know, yes, there's in and out and reception and action, but. But there's something in between those, which is really interesting, you know, interaction of various kinds where the world is different because of the way we perceive it. Maybe not enough, but maybe a little. Anyway, Elizabeth, did you want to continue? <clears throat> no, thanks. I want to listen. Daniel, will you? Will you? Yeah. Yeah, I'll put I'll put in my two cents, which is your your question about colonizing and how you avoid that. And I think Mary's point about Dickinson, I find true of Dickinson and of um, uh, Nidecker or Niedecker, however we pronounce it, um, which is that the, the one of the key strategies is a sense of humor. And, and that ends up being humble in a way, but it also means um, we're, we're in on the joke. We're not laughing at. And I think Dickinson does it endlessly. And, you know, the bat poem, um, his eccentricities, and the spider poem, I mean, I think they're, I think they're funny. And I think that's um, a sort of relaxation of the dominant species position where you get to giggle a little about the whole thing. Such a very interesting. Yeah, I, I like that idea a lot. And I, and I think it's really, it's really, um, an astute point because there's a, um, a a diminution of that gigantic romantic self that we're so used to associating with the you know the the prior generations of of 
poetry in dialogue with nature, you know, the, the, the ego just sort of taking over. And I think that that self irony in Dickinson supplies a lot of um, uh, avenues uh, to pursue uh, in understanding a, a more right-sized uh, ego. Yeah, and I think in terms of form, you see it in Dickinson where she's almost mocking herself in terms of writing poems that, that not only sort of take the hymn form in some cases, but also, and then make fun of it, but also the off rhymes and the kind of slant rhymes are, I, I think, almost always a joke, um, a, a serious joke, but a joke. And the opposite of it is people who are building the iron ore boats or tearing down the Amazon forest, which who are deadly serious. I mean, it's the opposite, I think it can be an awful thing, that kind of seriousness. But also Dickinson formally, in terms of her completely ambiguous language, where we really are, are forced to entertain two or more things at the same time, or we really cannot paraphrase. And that unparaphraseability seems so important in terms of focusing on unique, the unique quality, to refuse analogy, to force ourselves to look at what is singular and recognize that we have to acknowledge the singularity, including the fact that we cannot then, then represent another species, another object, another thing. Um, I wanted to um, just note that uh, where Beth and I started was um, this uh, phenomenon with Dickinson's poems about animals that vacate the human um, and become uh, the, the scene becomes the observation sometimes anthropomorphized of, of the animals but um, Rachel as, as I'm thinking about the your point your question about genre and form um, and what we were contemplating with uh, that starting place, what's the space that Dickinson created imaginatively? It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily poetic, it wasn't necessarily formal, but it was a different relationship to the space I know, I know. of the poem. It's a different way to approach the material. It's not field poetic, um, for example, but it's it's really thinking of what populates a different way of thinking about what populates the the poem. Um, and I found it very very hard to do that. I kept intruding, or um, concerns for humanity kept intruding. But I I raise it as a, a just sharing with you where our starting point was, and that's why we call it choreographs, which kind of got lost. But at any rate, we were contemplating that terrain that Rachel raises as a question. Yeah, that 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 is so important for for us to remember, and also that we were because we were working with a visual artist, a photo based artist. You know, the the tradition that that she has is really very much um, a kind of scientific gaze, and her career has sort of evolved around ideas of specimen collection and preservation. And so, I think that it raised for us this issue of how the scientific and the philosophical could merge with the lyric. Um, in ways that uh, created this dialogue with Dickinson. You know, so, so like the, there's the sort of these multiple angles of approach. Um, and Diane's central conceit was actually this sort of orb-like shape that the images all contain as a kind of under form um, because she loved the idea of circumference. So th this is something that, 
I would love to think about more is that the notion of circumference. What circumferences us? Who is in the circumference? Is someone or something out of the circumference? You know, uh, what, it, what is the we, I guess, is another way to think about that as was discussed earlier. Um, so, I don't know, but thank I'd you like, for the comments. I'd like to ask Jonathan a question, which is to say, it's funny, um, you've done so much work on ecopoetics, not to, you know, to say that no one else has, but just the question, how do you feel about when people evoke the romantics? Um, was Were they all terrible? <laughs> you know, did that overview look uh, over everything? Earth has not anything to show more fair, which I'm slightly parroting, which is an adorable poem, um, by the way. I, like, what is your position on nature poetry, or is it a flexible position? Uh, do you do you want? Do you think that putting the romantics in a in a box and closing the lid is a good strategy? Um, I'm just curious about uh, because I also remember how eco poetics at the conference that Ruth evoked, not to go back where people other people weren't at the ten attendance or whatever, but was um, it became slightly controversial as if oh, we don't need one more thing, you know, one more thing to think about. Oh, eco-poetics, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I wonder whether you could uh, talk to that a little bit, go down memory lane a bit or whatever. I don't um, mean to put you only on the spot if you don't want to be there, okay? That's just a little question <laughs> for this hour of the night. But, uh, um, I mean, I do. one thing I remember about that conference was Juliana Spar saying, I, I wish that the, 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 the eco-poetics and the Marxist poetics could have talked together, you know, that there was a sense in which, you know, the dominant conversation was really economics and, you know, but the poetry and economy and uh, eco-poetics was mar definitely marginal, felt marginal at that point in the ways that it does not now. Um, whether that was because it was classed with romanticism as some sort of no-no at the time, I'm not sure, but you know, I think when we say romantics, there are multiple, you know, it's not a homogeneous formation. And so uh, even within the same poet, even within Wordsworth, there are different periods as early Wordsworth and the late Wordsworth. Uh, I mean, to, I always begin my ecopoetic course with the lyrical ballads because I think it's, it's, it is like, to me, it's go, it strikes at the heart of what, uh, you know, the kinds of ambivalences that ecopoetics poetics invokes, including questions about language, you know, what kind of language is one used to address uh, uh, what, be it the sublime, but also cruelty, destitution, ruin. Um, but, you know, Claire, John Claire, is he a romantic? I mean, he, he really is a poet who uh, more and more uh, eco-critics go back to for lessons in how to um, expand that, circum that sense of circumference that, um, you know, was, has been discussed here. So I don't, you know, uh, I think the romantic ego, the high romantic ego uh, is certainly problematic. And it's something that ecopoetics, I like to think has done a lot to deconstruct, you know, without just dismissing it yes. or rejecting it. Um, to, to, to make that to make that I multiple and to, to acknowledge it's dividedness, which I think it was from the beginning between, you know, Wordsworth and Coleridge and, and then Keats, Keats's negative cap capability would just come up and Shelley's revolutionary uh, poetics. You know, I don't think ecopoetics has to be romantic. That's why, I, that's why I invoked the commodity poem. And I, you know, I loved hearing about the iron boats and, and sugar and yams, because I do think this notion of sort of nature as other, which is part of the other than human, I guess I've been thinking about it throughout this series of readings and, and, and my engagement with this anthology and I'm, I'm, I'm very drawn to that sense of alterity but I also am, am, am increasingly compelled by the nature cultures you know like yams for example the, the ways in which as humans we have co-created with what we call others what we call natures and and poetry language itself is a, is language a kind of nature culture you know is the poem the poem as a commodity as something that is inherently predatory, you know. So Oppen, you asked about Oppen earlier. I mean, you know, that was his concern was the sort of mineral fact and the extent to which language could approach 
that and 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 whether it's predatory nature was inherently problematic you know that somehow you, you had to sort of stand back from at the same time as you approach in language that's an attempt to answer in <laughs> okay. a couple minutes <laughs> a big question i'm gonna say I, I wanted to underscore the the we have to get beyond the this binary of nature culture culture is natural and a city is natural and you know we draw this line here's what's natural and we're somehow trying to negotiate our relationship to it instead of accepting the fact that it is all natural and we may do destructive things and we do bad things but they're natural things to do well, I, I use a hyphenated yeah. nature, nature culture, hyphenated nature culture. You know, there is the, like, like Gary Snyder says, there is the wilderness, you know, just because Bill McKibben says that, you know, there's no more nature doesn't mean you don't have the back of the beyond, the wild areas that are less impacted by human life. And then there are areas that are much more humanized, you know, um, where wild species won't, certain wild species won't thrive as well. So I think those distinctions are important. I, yeah, I, I think one of the things that was important to me with the phrase more than human to go back to that is that it's not other than human, right? And um, it also suggests that there are more than one human way of looking at things. So I wanted, I, I thought of it as encompassing. So we don't think of ourselves as just at this little edge of Western, you know, where Western science is incorporating art in a certain way. It reflects Western ecology. I wanted to think of it as being um, encompassing of all of human um, what experience and what that you know and and experience that goes beyond human. I think it would be great to see a poem that was written by a bee to a flower or something like that, where we're not even involved. But 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 that's not. I mean, obviously, that's not likely to happen, right? <laughs> so yeah. I just want to say, I see from the side chat that um, Charles has to leave soon. So I just wanted to say thank you, Charles, oh, yes. for being such a stalwart. And, um, you know, and bye. See everybody next week. <laughs> okay, I can't leave quite yet, though. I, 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 I wanted to register uh, a real appreciation for what Ruth did in her reading in invoking. Uh, Inanna and Homer and William Blake uh, that and connecting that to this eco poetics that and particularly when she stopped at Blake and said, do we believe in angels? And to me, you know, with Blake, it wasn't a matter of believing in angels. He talked to them and saw them. And that was just part of his. Maybe you could say more than human world, although <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> if that way or not. But uh, but I, I I mean I'm a student of literary history and but I like bringing all that to bear on you know what Evelyn said about how we must confront the present and and the, uh, and the present circumstances of ecos as we do. So thanks Ruth for extending the territory. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I really hope it continues. Thank you. Um, I, I agree, and thank you for yeah. commenting on Ruth's poem. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Absolutely, thank you. Beautiful. <laughs>